Hello, everybody. If you are here watching the replay, thanks for showing up. I'm Alyssa with Awaken Authenticity, and today, um, oh, maybe it wasn't live before, I'm not sure. Um, hello, everybody. Um, today, we are going to be talking a little bit about um, white fragility. Um, given the recent, as though it, it just never quits the racist situations that have been in the media with, um, I think her name is Amy Cooper, the woman that threatened to call police on the man that told her she wasn't allowed to have a dog off leash in Central Park, as well as the death of George Floyd. Um, I thought this was a very important time, um, although it's always an important time to shine a light on white fragility. Um, I just read this book with a group of people, um, and I took a lot of notes in it, and I led the, the book club that I had for it, and we had really fantastic and in-depth conversations about it, and I'm still learning from the things that we talked about, um, and I continue to, uh, I hope to continue doing so. The, the space that I'm coming from with this is that, like, what's the connection between authenticity and white fragility? Um, so I want you to just sort of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw this together, but I want you to kind of um, just let this wash over you for a moment. And when I posit to you that we live in a white supremacist culture, what are the feelings that you have? If you're like me, the first time that I heard that and heard that, um, you know, white supremacy um, was like rampant, I I was really uh, defensive and and not really willing to understand what that meant. Um, some other very common feelings around that um, might be, hold on, let me, I have a million notes and I'm just kind of jumping around. So forgive me while I flip um, throughout our discussion here today. Um, let's see. So it, it, you might feel like, um, you might feel like you're being attacked or if like someone said that you were racist, if you imagine someone said that you were racist, and I mean you, <laughs> um, you might feel singled out, you might feel attacked, or that you're being silenced, you might be feeling shame or guilt, you might feel like you're being accused, you might feel insulted or judged, that you might feel angry or scared, and you might feel outraged. Those are really common um, behaviors when we are being challenged. And I think that it's really important to recognize that those reactions and emotions um, are something that we can actively work on, um, let alone understanding where racism and um, um, white supremacy kind of exist in our culture. Um, so the connection to authenticity is that your emotional world is one of the eight pillars of authenticity. And um, the emotions that we have in response to these assertions are the result or uh, of the framework um, that we use to make sense of our social relations. And our social relations uh, connect to our community, which is community is another of the eight pillars of authenticity. Um, and so when we're dealing with white fragility, we're dealing with a couple, like two of the eight different aspects of having a, a strong, authentic place to come from in our world. And I think it's really important to um, examine all of those pillars, even the uncomfortable aspects of them. So that's why I'm having this conversation with you today.
If you're here, please uh, chit chat. Let me know in the comments that you're here so that I can see you. I'm not sure. Um, let me see if I can figure this out really quick. I've never done a live on Awaken Authenticity. So let me just see if I can find you guys on my phone so I can watch and see um, what you guys might be saying. Apologize, I maybe should have thought about doing this beforehand, but I'll be there in just a second. <clears throat> thinking about showing me what's going on. Okay, I can see that um, it is live. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh, hi, Sarah. Um, awesome. I am. It's working. So thanks. Yeah, keep keep texting. And I guess it works that if you're here live, then I can see you on the computer and I don't have to set it up on my phone anyway. Good to learn. We're all learning. <laughs> um, Sarah says, I'm listening while pestering folks to give money to black people. Awesome. Thank you for doing that important work. I just um, joined a group yesterday about helping with one-to-one uh, -one reparations. Um, we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm interested to see how that, how that improves things <laughs> or if it improves things or how much I'm able to be involved not having money myself. Um, but not to make this about me, this is something that I wanted to address. The when we're talking about racist, racism and race issues, it's important to focus on race issues and to not get distracted by other injustices, um, like disability or gender or, you know, any other, uh, any such thing. I think that all of these things need to be discussed in and of their own right. And when we conflate issues or um, we just like muddy the mix and that kind of decreases our ability to do the hard work. Um, so let's see, how do I wanna start this? I wanted to start this with a quote from the book on page 90. If you happen to have this book, you can follow along in which um, she says, uh, she being Robin DiAngelo, who is a white woman herself, she works in um, bringing education and attention to racist uh, issues. So she says, I remind my readers that I'm addressing white people at the societal level. So I, that's kind of what I'm hoping to do here in this little thing. I'm just kind of de like breaking down this book, which is designed for white people. So if you are a person of color, you are welcome here and thank you for being here. And if you're a white person, this is meant for you. I have friends who are black and whom I love deeply. I do too. I do not have to suppress feelings of hatred and contempt as I sit with them. I see their humanity. I hope that I always do. But on the macro level, I also recognize the deep anti-black feelings that have been inculcated in me since childhood. I'm sure that's the case. These feelings, um, the, I'm sure that's the case for myself. These feelings surface immediately. In fact, before I can even think when I conceptualize black people in general, the sentiments arise when I pass black strangers on the street, see stereotypical depictions of black people in the media and hear the thinly veiled warnings and jokes passed between white people. These are the deeper feelings that I need to be willing to examine for these feelings can and do seep out without my awareness and hurt those whom I love. And so when I first read that, I was like, I, that expresses to me um, where I feel like I sit with racism. Um, I intend to do my best and I don't always know if I'm doing my best. Um, I think that this is also some place that probably a lot of people feel like um, they identify with. So if that's you, if you identify with that paragraph that I just read, um, do a little hashtag identify 
so I know you're you're hearing this and and that um, we're not alone in this. I, I I also think that this is a great starting point to come from because I feel like the whole idea of white fragility is is that defensiveness that we get, and if we come to the table acknowledging our own potential deficits, then it kind of reduces the amount of defensiveness that um, other people might be feeling. <sighs> So that's the overview. I don't really know exactly what I want to talk about. And if you have anything you'd like me to address or if that you have thoughts about white fragility or if you've read this book or um, whatever, please let me know in the comments so that we can talk about them. I'm hoping this will be an ongoing conversation and not just a one one off thing. Um, I, because of the situation with um, the woman that I mentioned in the news, I thought that I would start with just sort of the idea of um, white fragility. So number number one, white. What is white fragility? White fragility is. Um, da -da -da, I think I have a, a little definition of it here somewhere. Um, that would have been a good idea to to highlight <laughs> things. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, white fragility is basically just like the the defensiveness that we feel when we're accused of racism, um, and that comes from basically the the binary that is a false dichotomy of Racist equals bad and not racist equals good. So when we, when we have that assumption and that dichotomy in our mind, um, it means that anytime you're called racist, you immediately think, no, you're calling me a bad person. When you say that I'm ras racist, I'm a bad person and I'm not capable of being good. Um, and so that's a, um, this is, the most recent adaptation of racism in recent history is this uh, um, this binary, and the you know re reducing racism to simple and isolated and extreme acts of prejudice is um, exactly the it, it helps to uphold racism because. Basically, when you like, I'm just going to kind of re reiterate this. When you say you're racist, people hear I'm bad, um, and they be go into a defensive character instead of reflecting on their behavior. And therefore, it becomes impossible to have um, a discussion or to, a, about racism or about their behavior or to have them understand what they've said that's maybe offensive or hurtful. Um, and therefore, um, it, you can't, if you say, if you have this dichotomy in your head, you can't interrupt racism. So it maintains the status quo of racism. Um, and so we first have to like let loose, let loose of that false dichotomy. Um, here is a quote from activist, uh, scholar and filmmaker Omawale Akintunde. He says, racism is a systemic, societal, institutional, omnipresent, and epidemiologically embedded phenomenon that pervades every vestige of our reality. For most whites, however, racism is like murder. The concept exists, but someone has to commit it in order for it to happen. This limited view of such a multi-layered syndrome cultivates the sinister nature of racism and in fact perpetuates racist phenomena rather than eradicates them. I think that pretty well sums up um, this whole problem. Um, so basically, if we, if we maintain for ourselves that we are not racist because we're a good person, then what that does for ourselves is um, it, it means that there's no action required for ourselves um, and therefore racism is not my problem. And, and that worldview guarantees 
that I'm not going to build my skills in thinking critically about racism or use my position of privilege to challenge racial inequality. So we first have to just acknowledge that we live in a systemically racist society um, and it's not our fault and that doesn't make us bad people. And that in order to change that racism, we have to acknowledge that we are um, racist and that doesn't make us bad people. Um, any questions or like thoughts about that? If you have them, just let me know. Cool. Um, okay, so back to Amy Cooper, I think that's her name. So she is someone who expressed her own white fragility like immediately and let me break that down for you. So she was challenged that she was doing something wrong and, um, and then she uses the unnamed idea and assumption that whites are superior. And the way that she did that is to um, victimize herself <laughs> and say, you're the one who's upsetting me and I'm going to demand that more resources are um, directed to me and assuaging my own issues that I want rather than, um, and, and she, and you know she made it specifically racial when she told the man that she was going to accuse him of threatening her um, to the police. So when you when you use the self defense claim that you know she she used a self defense claim saying that like she was being attacked, um, then. Here's, here's how that works. So number one, it identifies the speaker as morally superior while obscuring the true power of the social positions. So it, it, uh, she, she totally obscured the fact that she's a white woman and that the person telling her that her dog was off leash in a place where he wasn't allowed was a black man. Although she also um, said that explicitly. Um, she blamed the other person um, with the less power for her discomfort and falsely described it as dangerous. She did that pretty explicitly as well. And then by claiming to be the unfairly treated person in the situation, she reinscribes the racist imagery um, that, you know, the idea that she can't be the beneficiary of a racist society if the race, the white person is the victim. So, um, and then, and then she's through those uh, three claims that she was threatening to do um, by calling the police, um, she directly demands more societal resources, time and attention to herself rather than um, the, the racism at hand. <sighs> Let's see. Another thing that I wanted to mention here, racism, uh, let's see, Sarah says, racism is not a binary, is something I say all the time. It's not a light switch, people. Yes, thank you. Yes, exactly. Racism is not a binary. It's not good or bad. It's, um, it's something that exists that we get to work through together. Yeah. Um, okay, so white fragility, which is what this person in Central Park was expressing is a form of bullying and um, basically she's saying that she's gonna make it so miserable to confront her that it won't be rate that she won't be challenged again in the future and and I'm sure that you probably have had similar experiences um, uh, you know bullying bullying is is not only a racist situation. So um, if you can identify with that, if you've been bullied and you've had someone who um, makes it miserable to address the bullying that they're doing, you get it. Um, the way that white fragility acts as bullying are, are these things. So um, if, if someone, we kind of mentioned it already, if someone needs to 
um, cry or divert resources to themselves um, so that the resources rush back to them and the attention is diverted from the racism, that's, that's a form of bullying. So is responding with outrageous, I mean, with right, righteous outrage. If you respond to being challenged by arguing or minimizing or explaining or playing devil's advocate or pouting or tuning out and refusing to engage or and or withdrawing um, either physically or emotionally both all of those um, have the result of stopping the challenge altogether and uh, ensuring that the racism continues both because of your action um, and just also because uh, it tends to shut everybody else down to not be able to have the discussion. Um, the, the theory there is the sociology of dominance. And the important thing there is that societal power is not fixed. It needs to be um, maintained by establishing it and so you have to challenge when when the societal um power structure is challenged and you subvert the ability of people to do anything about it then you're helping to maintain that societal power inequity <sighs> okay so those are kind of like the main things. I, you know, I, I feel like I'm just barely scratching the surface here. There's so many fantastically interesting and in-depth things that um, I kind of want to talk about, but I don't know where to go from here because this is my first time talking about all of this and it's, it's a little overwhelming. Um, I think that, let's see, let me just see if there's anything else that, pops up that I really just need to say. <sighs> okay, so as far as like how we can deal with racism personally and as a society, number one, naming um, white, oh, ooh, okay, we can talk about um, white supremacy. That, that's something that I said at the beginning that I want to kind of follow up on. So the, the popular consciousness solely associates white supremacy, white supremacy with radical groups. And this is a reductive definition that obscures the reality of the larger system at work and prevents us from addressing the system. Um, that was a direct quote from the book. <laughs> so the U.S. spreads the idea of white supremacy as the idea of whiteness as the human ideal uh, through mass media, corporate culture, advertisements, missionary work, military presence, U.S.-owned manufacturing, historical, uh, colonial relations, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. So those are all of the ways that white supremacy is sort of just like inculcated us, inculcated in us, and um, we don't even question it. It just seems like the norm. And the, a, a lot of the power of white supremacy is the, um, is drawn from the fact that it's invisible. And so to ignore that and to ignore our United States white supremacist history is to cover the national plundering, which is bad, with another badness, which is national lying. So that kind of got me thinking about um, the, Im the importance of doing this work. Um, D'Angelo also says, our umbrage at the term white supremacy only serves to protect the processes it describes and obscure the mechanisms of racial inequality. And, and, and so naming white supremacy does two things to dismantle um, that power structure. One, it makes the system visible. And two, it shifts the locus of the change onto white people where it belongs. 
Um, yeah. So, like, I think that one of the problems about talking about racism amongst white people is that we don't see ourselves as having a stake in the game um, because we are raised to not think of ourselves as white. We're just raised to think of ourselves as the normal human and then anybody who is a person of color is considered to be a deviation from that norm. And so one of the ways that we can kind of dismantle that is to recognize for ourselves what role race um, has in shaping our lives. Um, and it, it definitely helped me to kind of name the, these things rather than just not looking at them, I guess. <laughs> so the number one way that race shapes the lives of white people is that you can probably say, I belong racially. I belong. That's huge. That's a huge feeling that um, we take for granted. Um, you don't, you don't, I don't carry the psychic wake, weight of race. Um, a lot of people have an assumption of servitude of people of color, like people of color are there to serve you. And that's not something that is really, um, uh, it, it's a, insidious aspect of racism that we expect that if we look around a room it's going to be the black person or the person of color who's there to like take our coat and hang it up or to teach us about racism um and and whiteness has the psychological advantages that translate into material returns right so like we we are more likely to have an upward mobility um, because of our whiteness. Okay, there's there's so many more, but I'm going to skip those for now. But if you want to hear more about it, just let me know in the comments. We'll come back to it. And then, let's see. Okay, so we were talking a little bit about the things that we can do about all of this. And I think that um, there's, there's two big things that I want to say. One is to, um, three things. One is stopping our own racist patterns. Um, and to do that, we have to consider that, um, let's see, how do I want to phrase this? We have to recognize that working on them is more important than convincing other people that we don't have them. <laughs> so that good, bad binary, we, we get to work on releasing that conceptualization. We get to work on recognizing that um, dismantling our own racism is definitely more important than convincing people that we are a good person, that we're not racist. So here I am, I'm saying, I'm racist. How can I not be? I, I'm in this culture. I'm a white woman who was inculcated to take my whiteness for granted and to behave the way that I behave. Um, and I'll use this moment to say that I, um, if you're a person of color and you ever, or a white person who ever sees me um, screwing up or saying things in a way that is maybe not very sensitive, I welcome the opportunity to um, be told that. Um, so that brings me to number two. Number two is to... Um, to have two guidelines in your own life 
when someone does give you feedback, these are the things that you must consider when someone gives you constructive criticism. How, when, and where someone gives you feedback is irrelevant. It's the feedback itself that uh, we want and need, and we have to understand that it's really difficult to give that feedback in the first place. And so it is our responsibility to take that anyway. Um, and, you know, no matter how that feedback is given, we will, from our position of societal, cultural, and institutional white power and privilege, we can recognize that we are perfectly safe and that we can handle it. And if we can't handle it, it's on us to build our racial stamina. So building racial stamina is, um, it's the antidote to white fragility. And it is the ability to bear witness to the pain of racism that we cause. And uh, it's the ability to let go of the messenger and focus on the message, on the message. And that's an advanced skill. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, and if you have been challenged in any way, let me know in the comments, say, um, hashtag challenged. <laughs> I think that I have in the past. And the second part of that guideline is to say thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank the person for the feedback. And then when you are processing the feedback, make sure that you're processing that feedback with another white person. Make sure that you are um, not projecting any um, fallout that you might personally have from that as you're building your stamina, your racial stamina. Um, to, um, you're not projecting it onto a person of color. And um, because to do so would be to perpetuate the white fragility and to perpetuate the idea that the resources need to be turned on to you. So process the information in private and make sure that if you need to do it with somebody that you're doing it with your therapist or a really good friend who's also white. Okay, so those are the first two things. The third thing is to share this list. Um, these are ideal assumptions to have. And by re-ascribing the assumptions that we have and actively kind of like rewriting the narrative that we have in our brain and on our minds, we can um, help break down racism for ourselves and within our society. So here are those ideal assumptions. I'm just going to read them. I'm going to read them slowly. And if you hear any of them that is um, one that you know that you need to work on, um, you know, let me know in the comments which one applies to you if there's one or two that that apply more to you. Okay, here they are. Being good or bad is not relevant. Racism is a multi-layered system embedded in our culture. All of us are socialized into the system of racism. Racism cannot be avoided. <coughs> Whites have blind spots on racism and I have blind spots on racism. Six, racism is complex, and I don't have to understand every nuance of the feedback to validate that feedback. Seven, whites are slash I am unconsciously invested in racism. <coughs> Eight, bias is implicit and unconscious. I don't expect to be aware of mine without a lot of ongoing effort. Nine, Giving us white people feedback on our is risky for people of color. So we can consider the feedback that they give us a sign of trust. 10, feedback on white racism is give, difficult to give. 
and how I am given the feedback is not relevant, uh, not as relevant as the feedback itself. 11. Authentic anti-racism is rarely comfortable. Discomfort is key to my growth and thus desirable. Uh, 12. White comfort maintains the racial status quo. So discomfort is necessary and important. 13. I must not confuse comfort with safety. As a white person, I am safe in discussions of racism. 14. The antidote to guilt is action. And I'm going to post a list of action that we can take in the comments. Uh, 15, I don't know what number we're on. It takes courage to break with white solidarity. How can I support those who do? 16, I bring my group's history with me. History matters. Um, and this is true for people even if they were born in other countries. Simply by being a white person in this country, no matter where you were born or what your um, history of um, um, immigration is, the fact that we live in a society that was built by blacks and taken from them by whites is a huge part of racism and so to deny that is racist. It takes courage to break with white solidarity. How can I support those who do? Oh, I just said that. Um, given my socialization, it is much more likely that I am the one who doesn't understand the issue. So if you ever feel like someone is um, challenging you, um, approach that feedback with curiosity and try to understand where they're coming from. Um, that's a really great place to start. Nothing exempts me from the forces of racism. My analysis must be intersectional, a recognition that my other social identities class, gender, ability, inform how I was socialized into the racial system. And finally, racism hurts, even kills people of color 24-7. Interrupting it is more important than my feelings, ego, or self-image. Um, and so, I don't know, that's the way forward, I guess. <laughs> we have to internalize those above ideals to to be someone who is positively making a difference um, and the bottom line is that we have to care enough to to become informed <sighs> let's see okay let's see so i've talked for 40 minutes here about this um, and i i hope that that was informative or helpful for you um, I'm going to make this public so that you can share it if you find it helpful. You can tag people in it if you find it helpful. Um, if you see or, or have feelings about where we can improve beyond the things that I shared, I would love to hear your ideas and um, considerations and suggestions and thoughts about anything that I've said. I, I feel like... I don't know, I spent all morning and afternoon so far, um, like, you know, just rewriting the notes that I took on that book. And I felt while I was doing it, like, it was really good for my own edification to re-examine and re-remind myself of what I had learned when I read the book. But now that I'm saying it, I have a lump in my throat. I feel like it's just not enough. And, and I also am remembering that there's a chapter called White Women's Tears. So I don't want to go there. <laughs> I don't want to like, I don't want to um, cry um, because that puts the focus on me. Um, and I actually am going to finish with uh, something that says that um, so I started this conversation with emotions and how that connection between emotions and authenticity is the connection to this idea of white fragility. And I'm going to say that our emotions are political because they are often externalized and our emotions drive uh, 
behaviors that have a real impact on people. And it's the impact, not the intention that matters. Um, and so rather than crying, I am going to turn this off and um, put a list of things that we can do as white people. And oh, I see, see, Pam says, I don't think racism can be confronted without simultaneously grappling with gender. While all white people benefit from systems of privilege, all men benefit from misogyny. I think that that is um, the, a true statement, but a separate statement. And I think that um, they are important things to be dealt with at the same time. I mean, I could easily say the same thing about able-bodiedness and disabled people, um, but that is not what we're talking about. And if you just hopped on, Pam, I would suggest going back and watching the replay because I do address that a little bit. But thank you for popping up. I think it's really important to to express our um, where we are in this uh, learning space. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Um, I will talk to you guys soon. Have a great day.